modern karate is actually less than 100 years old. Because originally it was called Todi. That's what all the old masters said before it was modernized in 1936. Before there were different styles, tournaments, uniforms and belts. Todi literally means Chinese hand. In other words, if you practice karate today, you might actually be practicing a form of ancient kung fu. I know, it sounds crazy. Which is why I've traveled to Fujian province to explore the southern kung fu styles that influence the roots of karate. By cross-comparing different sources and experiencing hands-on practice with grandmasters of traditional kung fu, I'm hoping to uncover what the Okinawan pioneers discovered when they created the art of karate. Follow along an epic adventure to rediscover the lost roots of karate. As Jesse Encap uncovers the ancient source of karate's kung fu connection. This is what the history books never told you. You're watching Karate Nerd in China. I'm on my way to explore the roots of karate the martial art that I've been practicing my whole life. But this time, I'm not going to Japan. Don't get me wrong, we all know that the Japanese island of Okinawa is the birthplace of karate. I've been there a dozen times already, getting my butt kicked from living legends of the art. But now, it's time to fly further back in history, to before the word karate even existed. Day one in China. Wow, I am actually here. This is what it looks like. I'm gonna be traveling around training with different masters of various Kung Fu styles that go back in history and connect to the roots of karate. And I'm gonna share everything with you. The only problem is I actually don't know anything about this place. I don't know how to do it, where to go, who to meet or which is why. I contacted the biggest Kung Fu nerd in all of China and he took an eight hour train ride just to come here and help us out. Let's go meet him. The dude sitting on that chair is named Will. He's a British bloke who's been living in China for the past decade to study Kung Fu. His biggest passion is to travel around China to talk and train with Kung Fu experts. Will's job is to help me film the trip and translate what the old masters are saying. The only problem is, neither of us have ever been to southern China before. That's why we need a third person. That person is Alex. Alex is the secretary of the local martial arts federation. And today is my lucky day, because he's organizing a special demonstration of Kung Fu that I'm invited to. This will be a good introduction to the Chinese martial arts for me. As an outsider, I have no idea what to expect. But I'm trusting Alex and Will to guide me on this journey. And then it starts. This is not what I expected. Turns out, it's just a bunch of kids doing wushu. You know, the modern acrobatics. Don't get me wrong, it's very impressive and entertaining. But this is not what I came for. I'm looking for the traditional stuff. Suddenly, the music stops. And a practitioner of white crane kung fu enters the mat. This dude is moving in a completely different way. That's when I realize it. I'm watching Nepai, or Nipaipo as we call it in Japanese one of the most advanced forms in karate. I literally became the Nordic champion with this exact kata. It's one of my favorites. But this version is so much more complex. The way we do it in karate is very minimalistic in comparison. Or, dare I say, simplistic. The rest of the demonstration was basically more wushu again including some weapons, some ladies doing Tai Chi, and the reincarnation of Bruce Lee. Plus, 
a weird style of kung fu called incense shop boxing. But I didn't care about any of that because I had already hit jackpot. Wow, I can't believe I've already been exposed to one of the most important kung fu styles in the history of karate. I am so excited to learn more about white crane kung fu. Two hours later, it's time for lunch at Alex's dojo. I have the great honor of sitting at the master's table. If this is what lunch looks like in China, I think I'm gonna stay here. And this is the most famous dish in the city. A fish ball with a meatball inside. And then it happens. One of the masters from my table hears that I'm a karate nerd. So he invites me to his dojo to, I quote, play some kung fu. Turns out I hit the jackpot again. You see, this is no ordinary old man. This is Master Yu. He's been practicing white crane kung fu for 70 years. His style of white crane is called Ming He, or whooping crane in English. I have no idea what's about to happen, but we're gonna play some kung fu. <laughs> According to Master Yu, this is the style that many of the historical karate pioneers learned when they came to China. Mm. Apparently, the founder of White Crane was a woman. For this reason, it doesn't rely on using brute force. Instead, you must find a different angle where your opponent can't leverage his power. Only then can you overcome a stronger opponent. Can you hold this? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the right angle. Yeah. 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 White Crane combines soft, circular movements with hard, straight movements. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. But strangely enough, the classical straight karate punch is almost never used. Instead, they prefer open-handed strikes or forearm strikes with the all nine radius bones, or heaven and earth bones, as they call them in Chinese. To the face also? Not right. Yeah. Yeah. Do they use any kicking techniques also? Uh, just like when you meant the Huh? Yeah. Like a tripping. Funny thing is, Master Yu thinks he's teaching me Kung Fu, but all I'm learning is Karate. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Block, block. <laughs> because this is a technique that we see a lot. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, sorry. No, 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 no. After a well-deserved tea break, 
Master Yu invites us to his home to show us his latest innovation. Take off my shoes, right? Yeah. A hanging fish. I have long, long ears. Mm. Long, long ears. Long, long ears. Mm. Made out of wood that you use to condition your forearms. Apparently, this is what old Kung Fu masters used hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Okay. What does it smell like? What do you think? I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. And then it happens. The moment I had been waiting for. The unspoken test. You see, every time I've visited a karate master, they test me. Not necessarily my physical skills, but my character. Because they want to see if you're worthy of going further. Did I pass? We will never know. But moments later, Master Yu takes me to his private room and shows me something that blows my mind. A copy of the most important karate book in history that he rescued as a little boy when the communists burnt down his father's belongings. That book is the Bubishi, or Wu Beiji as it's called in Chinese an ancient manual of combat, secretly passed down for generations. The old masters called it the Bible of Karate. I couldn't believe my eyes. Neither could Patrick McCarthy, the Western world's number one karate researcher, who's dedicated his life to studying the Bubishi. Bubishi is a very classical indicator of times long gone by, and because it is the only one a uh, written source that is extant today, which just happens to be from the same era as was the transitioning metamorphosis to which these Chinese practices sorry, and, and Southeast Asian practices metamorphosize into being what would ultimately become karate is no coincidence. It's part and parcel of what it is. You can tell that's, that is the original Bubishi right there. It, it's it. And, and, and that my presentation is almost verbatim the same as that. According to the Bubishi, two specific Kung Fu styles influenced the creation of karate. The first and most famous one is White Crane Kung Fu. And the birthplace of White Crane is a village called Yongchun. You're not any particular style. You are just the progenitor result of years of transition. But you know, this is the place. And I think that that's what you're going to see in Yongchun. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hope to see you again. It was time to stop relying on luck and start relying on facts. If I wanted to trace the roots of karate, I needed to follow the Bubishi and travel to Yongchun. But first, Master Yu wanted to teach me one last thing. This is the Crane Temple. It's 7.30 a.m. and I've been promised to learn the essence of Whooping Crane Kung Fu. They call it Ba Bu Lian. In the local dialect, it's pronounced Pa Buren. And yes, it shares both name and movements with the modern version you see in karate tournaments. Alex lights incense and prays to the Crane Temple. And then my lesson begins. <coughs> Overlooking the Crane Valley, where all the white crane kung fu practitioners used to live in the old days, I am learning the most important form in the style. The secret lies in the breathing pattern, which regulates your muscular contraction and relaxation. Mm. 
These movements are then translated to real-life fighting applications. No. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Huh? I'm not sure what impressed me the most. Master Yu's knowledge, enthusiasm, or patience. Together. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Needless to say, even though we practiced for hours, I'm pretty sure we only scratched the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, As I wave goodbye to the Crane Temple, it dawns on me that I'm literally walking in the footsteps of the old karate masters. All I have to do is follow the Bubishi. And right now, it's telling me to visit Yongchun, the birthplace of White Crane. Today, it's time for a road trip. But first, coffee. My jet lag kept me awake all night. And I gotta stay focused today. Because... Wait! What the heck? Is that a cat backpack? Anyway, as I was saying, today we're going to Yongchun Village, where Alex booked a meeting with the White Crane Research Association. I have no idea what to expect, but I'm super excited. Before I know it, we're there. It's obvious that this town is famous for its Kung Fu. As we arrive, we're greeted by the head of the association, Master Tsun. His job is to research, preserve, and promote the art. Uh, wow, we're at the birthplace of the White Crane Kung Fu. Surprisingly, White Crane actually has a lot of weapons. But they're very different from what we see in karate. The coolest one is a trident, originally used to kill tigers. The secret is to squat down and wait for the tiger to pounce on you. Every white crane school has a statuette of the woman who founded the style. Her name was Fang, and she came to Yongchun in the 16th century. Back then, Southern China was a lawless country, full of bandits and criminals. So, to defend herself, she created her own style of Kung Fu. Hmm. And her first student was actually her husband. White Crane also incorporates lots of strength training tools. This heavy pole, for example. Over a cup of green tea, I learned that the oldest white crane dojo in town belongs to the Pan family. If we're lucky, we might be able to visit later today. But first, it's time to see the most important kata in Yongchun. And the man who knows it best lives up on the mountain. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Let's see. This is Master Cheng. At first glance, 
He might seem like an unassuming farmer, but looks can be deceiving. Turns out, Master Jing is an expert at Sanjan. In Japanese, we call it Sanjin. This form is considered to be the essence of white crane in Yongchu. Wow, thank <laughs> you. Very impressive. Apparently, there are many different versions of this kata, but all versions share the same universal principle of body structure. Wow. Oh, are you mean? You mean? How do you do this one? You know, I'm going to now. The key is to align your joints and stack your bones to connect with your center of gravity, thereby becoming virtually immovable. When the principles of Sanjan are applied correctly, even a small and weak person can become powerful. <laughs> it's just biomechanics. It's very strong. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Now there's only one stop left before we visit the oldest dojo in Yongchun. This is the White Crane Memorial Hall. Basically, it's a museum in the middle of the jungle. Turns out that White Crane has many different styles, like Flying Crane, Sleeping Crane, Feeding Crane and Whooping Crane the style that I learned from Master Yu. Some people even argue that Wing Chun, the style that Bruce Lee practiced, is also a style of white crane. That's why he made those whooping sounds, just like a crane. As the history lesson comes to an end, Alex pays his respects and prays to the statue of Fang, before we're finally dropped off at the dojo. The school we're about to visit was established in 1928. So Alex, where are we now? It's a uh, Wangongshu uh, master plan's uh, place. Ah, uh, it's a dojo. Okay. It's a very, very old dojo. It's been said that every master in Yongchun started their journey here. This is the most famous dojo yes, of, of the course. white crane. Yes. Hey, hey. 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 Yeah. 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 <laughs> when I walk in, it feels like I'm in a kung fu movie. This is the birthplace of white crane kung fu. This is Master Pan. He's taking care of the dojo since his father passed away recently. His father was very famous and had students all over the world. Pan Jr. literally grew up in this dojo. He's been practicing white crane for over 40 years. <laughs> when I ask Master Pan what's written on the whiteboard, he says it's a list of their forms. But strangely enough, 
it doesn't include any of the kata I'd seen previously on my trip. That's because the bubishi stuff isn't practiced in Yongchun. I'd gone too far back in history. They don't even do the forceful breathing I learned from Master Yu. The closest thing they have to classical karate is this old two-person exercise. Mm. One circle and then re, uh, re, do it again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. <laughs> As we cool down with some tea, Master Pan reveals something very interesting. Fang Qinyang's father learned Southern Shaolin, ah. and then she added the crane movement by mimicking how the cranes moved, and she added that into it. I couldn't believe what I just heard. You see, the Shaolin Temple is mentioned everywhere in the history of karate. According to the research of Patrick McCarthy, the old karate masters had up to 13 distinct ways of referencing Shaolin in their writings. Okinawan styles like Shorin-ryu, Kobayashi-ryu, Shorinji-ryu, Shorei-ryu, and Matsubayashi-ryu literally translate to Shaolin style. And almost every dojo in Okinawa has a picture of a Bodhidharma hanging on the wall. He's the spiritual grandfather of Shaolin Kung Fu. In fact, half of the bubishi is said to be about monk fist boxing, the style practiced at Shaolin. But Master Pan is not talking about the famous temple you see on TV, because that's in the north and it's mostly for tourists. This is a smaller, southern Shaolin temple, and many people don't even know it exists. Perhaps that's where I'll find the missing piece of the karate puzzle. I'm so excited. As we leave the old dojo, all I want to do is grab the first train to Shaolin. But before we leave Yongchun, Master Pan wants to introduce us to one of his father's old friends. This is Master Su. He's been teaching White Crane for 60 years. So imagine how long he's been training. Thank you very much. I'm literally sweating tea at this point, and my jet lag is kicking in real hard. Luckily, Will is ready to take some pain. So saying that karate doesn't have this, this kind of uh, coil, like grab. Mm. Mm. So you see, he can. Mm. Mm. From the middle, he can strike easily mm. from this. Position. Apparently, Master Su is an expert on joint locks. He calls this a softer form of white crane. The goal is to be like a rod of steel wrapped in cotton. Strong inside, soft outside. <sighs> Don't be tense like that. Mm. Be relaxed. Yeah. Mm. So these three joints want to be relaxed. Mm. Your power won't come out if you're too tense, so you want to relax. Mm. So this is like the internal power here. Mm. It's like I'm not even using force. Having strength is like having money. Strength is like money that you can just lose it quite easily. Because you're saying crane shouldn't be hard or tense because it was founded by a woman. He's like, if, 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 if a woman came up to you and was like, you're not going to marry her, are you? So she should be graceful. Yeah. 
Before we leave Master Su, we're treated to a demonstration by his daughter. Although her performance is lovely, this whole visit just confirms my belief that I've gone too far down the rabbit hole of White Crane. After all, I'm here to learn karate, not kung fu. Thank you very much. We thank the master and his daughter for the honor, then head back to the city. So Will, how does your hand feel? It's in pain. Like, seriously, I wasn't exaggerating. I was trying to not react to it. Yeah. Uh, because I didn't, want, I didn't want him to stop showing anything, right? So yeah. I was trying to hold the pain, but I was yeah. in absolute agony. I mean, Where did it hurt? Like, I was like, like here, it was just a very tiny movement. Like what he did was he, he basically said that you open this joint by like a micrometer. Yeah. And, and that's like the key to the grab. Yeah. So and then you can't resist. Yeah, he, he, he hardly did anything, but it just straight down like that. And you, yeah. you just cannot, you can't cool. do anything against it. That was amazing. <laughs> it's been a long day in Yongchun and I've learned so much. But it's time to shift gears. There are so many karate things I still haven't found here, like deeper stances, more kicks, long distance movements and closed hand techniques. But I know exactly where to look now. It's time to visit the Southern Shaolin Temple. I'm on my way to find the Southern Shaolin Temple. Unfortunately, nobody knows where the original one is because it was burnt down. Today, there are many Southern Shaolin Temples and they all claim to be the real one. The one we're going to is in the town of Chuanzhou. I'm hoping it's the right one because it might be the missing link in karate's history. In the meanwhile, Alex has taken us to one of his friends who teaches a unique style of Kung Fu. This is his dojo. Hey, At first glance, it looks like a regular Kung Fu academy, complete with deadly ancient weapons and kids screaming in agony. But here, they teach a special style of Kung Fu. According to Nakamoto Masahiro, the karate historian who's strangling me with a pair of nunchucks, this unique Kung Fu style was practiced at the King's Castle in Okinawa. The style is called dog boxing, and the man getting his butt kicked in this photo is actually Nakamoto Masahiro. What a coincidence. Yeah, have a seat. Okay. No. Dog boxing is a form of Chinese ground fighting. It consists of eight different kata and hundreds of functional applications divided into two categories. How to take someone down to the ground and how to defend yourself when you're on the ground. <laughs> Although dog boxing didn't influence karate directly, it's still a fascinating style, especially since it was practiced by the king's guards at the courtyard of Shuri Castle. Sure, dog boxing might have been practiced in ancient Okinawa, but it feels like a sidetrack and it's not even mentioned in the Bubishi. 
so I gotta keep moving on. Back to Shaolin. We finally arrive in the ancient town of Chuanzhou. Marco Polo once said it had the world's greatest port, but we're not going to the coast. Strangely enough, our taxi driver doesn't know where Shaolin is. Then, from out of nowhere, it suddenly appears. This is the Southern Shaolin Temple. It's time to film an epic entrance. No. Yeah, let's just... Okay. This walks like straight behind me. Okay. He's done it again. What the hell? I'm, I'm not touching. I'm not touching anything. I literally didn't touch anything. I just. <laughs> no, I, I believe you. I can't believe I'm actually here. It's like a dream come true. Time for a kick pick. Oh, this random Chinese guy also wanted to take a photo. Okay, sit here. Got it? Oh, you left me hanging. <laughs> left me hanging. As we enter the temple grounds, I quickly realize that this place is huge. There are dozens and dozens of buildings, full with beautiful and terrifying sculptures, surrounding different places of Buddhist worship, and the temple complex seems to stretch itself far up the mountain. But I'm not seeing any signs of Kung Fu. Suddenly, something catches my eye. It's a stone with Chinese characters on it. When I ask Will to translate, he blows my mind. On Southern Kung Fu? Really? Yeah. So, wait, this stone tablet outside the Shaolin Temple literally says you should pass on Kung Fu. Yeah, Southern Kung Fu. Southern Kung Fu, yeah. not that Northern bullshit. Yeah. I have a feeling we're on the right path. Perhaps we might find some monk fist boxing here after all. But strangely enough, I haven't seen a single monk so far. The place almost feels abandoned. So Will, how about you explain why I had to walk over that kind of wooden beam on the ground? All right, so <clears throat> in all the temples in China and in like traditional households, they have these kind of like a step. It's called a mankan. I'm not sure exactly how you translate it in English. You're not, you're not allowed to step on it. You have to step over it. And the reason it's there is to trip over ghosts and to stop, because ghosts are like the bringers of bad luck, right? So it's to trip them over and stop them coming into your home or your temple or whatever. As we keep walking, I stumble upon something that gives me hope. I've seen these things in Kung Fu movies. They're known as Plum Blossom Poles. Look, there it is. The famous Plum Blossom Poles. I'm gonna give them a try. I hope they don't mind. I totally feel like a Shaolin monk right now. Oh, this is harder than it looks. <laughs> I think that's enough for my first try. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet these small ones are for the kids or maybe the beginners or really old people. And then we got the super tall ones here and then kind of they, they slope downwards here. I kind of jumped off around here. And then they start down here. What a cool traditional exercise. I think I'm gonna build me a set of those at home. Hello. Hey. Shaolin monk. And then it happens. Camera. We finally meet a real Shaolin monk. <laughs> Are you actually, is he a Shaolin monk? I think so. Let me talk about it. Let me talk about it. 
He's actually one of the senior monks in the temple. I think we just met a real Shaolin monk. If you look closely, you can see that he has 12 circular burn marks on his head. That means he's taken the strictest vows of the temple. And now he's inviting us for tea. How long has he been a monk? Since yeah. more than 30 years. Wow. So is this where the monks live? Uh, no, no, no. He's like, we need to bow to Buddha. This one? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Wow. Am I a Buddhist now? I guess so. I'm shocked. I have so many questions. Like, how do you live here? What do you do all day? Do you know Kung Fu? What do you eat for breakfast? Turns out, he meditates for 8 hours per day and only eats vegetables. But he doesn't practice martial arts. However, there are other monks who do. They're called warrior monks. And if we go further up the hill, we might find them. I am so excited. In just a few minutes, I might find an ancient source of karate's history. Because so we just left the Shaolin monk and now I can hear that they're training over there. So let's see if there's some actual Shaolin Kung Fu practice going on. Oh my gosh, it's a young warrior monk performing a kata in front of his teacher. Okay, we're gonna go talk to that kid practicing with the weapon. When the monks see us approaching, they suddenly go quiet. It's a This feels so awkward. But then Will tells them that I practice karate. And that's when everything changes. So the guy is saying that the mayor of Okinawa was here. And that, that letter was... Oh really? That letter was sent to them by the mayor of Okinawa saying that this is the roots of karate. This is the exact place I wanted to find. Uh, this is his main weapon. This is his, oh, his like, specialty. Thing. I immediately ask Will if they can show me some empty hand stuff. To my big surprise, they reply by giving me a private lesson. Believe it or not, the first thing they teach me is literally the first thing I teach my karate students back home straight punches. It's like Chinese karate. The shoulders always so square. You, you sort of uh, twist out, but you, you reset. Uh -huh. yeah, this way. Mm. It feels like I'm learning the karate stuff that White Crane was missing. This could be what the second half of the Bubishi is all about. Unfortunately, the lesson abruptly stops when an old monk crashes our party. Apparently, monks are not allowed to teach outsiders and, well, I'm not exactly ready to become a monk myself. As a result, we're escorted to the entrance. Luckily, there is a Kung Fu master outside of Shaolin that can teach us more. His dojo is actually right here in Chuanzhou. If Will gives him a call, we might be able to visit him in the morning. It's been a long day at Shaolin, and the visit was way above my expectations. I am speechless. It's been such an amazing time here at the Shaolin Temple. I hope you guys really like that. Tomorrow is a new day, and I'm ready to rediscover the lost roots of karate. How about you?
It's a brand new day in Chuanzhou. I only have three days left here in China, and today I'm meeting a master of the Kung Fu style practiced by the southern Shaolin monks. As we're walking to the master's place, something interesting pops up. Oh, there's somebody in there. <laughs> can just say hello. <laughs> hello. No, maybe can we speak to him? Can we go inside? To have a look? It would be nice to see a courtroom. Oh, this is my house. This is my house. This is my house. Oh, no. Oh, wow. It's not. We thought it was a house. No, no. Does he live here? It's his home, yeah. Can, can we look? We can see. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Wow. So we're actually entering a real courtyard in some old dude's home here. What was his name? I don't know. Lao Xin Guixin. Yan? Yan Zhe de Yan. Master Yan. Mr. Yan. Oh, nice to meet you. I'm uh, Jesse. That's my name. How long has he lived here? Six generations of family. Wow! Is that his ancestors? This is his ancestors, yeah, so each generation of people. Wow. But I got I gotta ask, does he know Kung Fu? His younger brother has a Kung Fu school in America. What? Yeah. Really? I mean, this like is lots of different styles. Wow. Just like a family style. I can't. Wow, this is so cool. We're actually inside this dude's house. Oh. This is Tang Tang Chao, right? These are from the Tang Dynasty. These are like over a thousand years old. Wow! This is Tang Shan. This is Han Dynasty. This is from the Han Dynasty. That's like two thousand years old. So it's very valuable. Yeah. Han Dynasty only. That's the sort of stuff you get in a museum, like wow. priceless. Do you mind asking if he has any uh, martial arts stuff? Yeah. He does. <laughs> a sword. A sword? <laughs> Can you come on? He says it's broken. Wow. It's a how many years? This should be a It's a foreign one. It's not Chinese. This should be a He's like, this is just his hobby. He just likes to just <laughs> yeah. collect these antiques. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. In the olden days, martial arts was never something that you would see in the public. It was always done inside these courtyards. Mm. So. You'd never know. You'd never know that that's a kung fu master. And so there. that's why the Chinese word for disciple means what e entering the door. Entering the yeah, door. Rumor. And so it's, you, you've been allowed into the courtyard. You're, right. You're sort of welcomed in to come and train and sort of joining so, the family. So they would events. actually practice inside that courtyard. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so cool. After a brisk walk, we finally reach our destination. I am so excited. Thank you. Okay. This is Master Chang. He's been practicing Kung Fu for 40 years and holds one of the highest ranks issued by the Chinese government. He's also a very busy entrepreneur. Mm. But Master Chang doesn't practice monk fist. He practices something called five ancestors fist. Yeah. Uh, more tight. Yeah. Ah. I am so confused right now. I thought this was the Shaolin stuff. Well, yes and no. Five Ancestors Fist contains a little monk fist, but it also contains white crane. It's actually a mix of five different Kung Fu styles. The reason they practice this style at Shaolin is because nobody knows monk fist anymore. It was lost when the temple burnt down. After they rebuilt the temple, 
they introduced five ancestors as their new style. This means we might never find the last piece of the karate puzzle. But according to Master Chang, Five Ancestors still has an important connection to karate. Wow! This is like a karate weapon. Yeah. It's the sign. Although the modern translation of karate is empty hand, the Okinawan masters also used weapons. And they have tons of weapons in Five Ancestors. This sai is over a hundred years old. It was originally used by Chinese law enforcement to catch criminals. This is really yeah, don't drop it. <laughs> is this also a hundred years old? Yeah, they're all about. He doesn't know the exact this, age, but you, you, yeah. Okay. Ah, to protect, it's okay. to catch. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twist. Mm. Rhythm. Uh, mm. Rhythm. Okay. Ah, uh, twist. Uh, twist it and then. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. If we follow Master Chang to his school, we can see even more. This is actually not his dojo. It's just a kung fu themed hotel that he owns. <laughs> Master Chang's dojo has two floors. According to Will, he's most likely a multi-millionaire because very few people have this kind of wealth in communist China. Mm, same thing. Turns out, the weapons used in Five Ancestors are almost identical to karate. Master Chang uses the staff exactly like I teach it back home. Mm. 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 Yeah. And this famous karate weapon, known as Tongguai in the local dialect, was apparently invented here in Chanzhou. The name literally translates to small walking stick. That's the exact same moves we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's the exact same techniques that, that we do. It's becoming really clear that five ancestors played a major part in the evolution of karate. But not perhaps in the empty hand way. The real dojo turns out to be on the second floor and it's huge. Complete with a beautiful altar classical strength and conditioning tools, plus dozens of more weapons, half of which I thought were unique to Okinawa. But one thing that really stands out is this piece of wood. The purpose of this badass heavy bag is to condition your bones and develop your ability to receive impact. Oh, sorry. Hmm. Five Ancestors has a lot in common with White Crane, but one big difference is the footwork. Notice how Master Chang steps with his full body into each technique instead of standing still. Wow. Hmm. Fast and stable. Five Ancestors also uses the heavy pole I saw in Yongchun. But this time, I actually get to try it. Is it oh, oh, yes. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> Wait, hold it wider. 
I gotta say, this thing really develops your core stability. It's an excellent tool. The hands change from yin and yang. The more I learn, the more I feel like Five Ancestors is the MMA of Kung Fu. Not that they do any full contact cage fighting, but because it's literally a mix of everything. The style even includes dog boxing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mostly interested in the weapons, because that's the karate connection. After taking a few more phone calls, it seems like Master Chang needs to go and take care of business. But then he starts looking for something. I have no idea what's about to happen. Turns out, he wants to demonstrate one last kata before we leave. And then our visit is over. I am so happy to have discovered karate's old weapons. But I'm also a little disappointed. I was truly hoping to find the original Shaolin style. My time here in China is almost over. And I honestly don't know what to do now. Is this the end? In a moment of desperation, I decide to call up my old mentor, Patrick McCarthy. After all, he spent his whole life researching the roots of karate. If anybody can help me, it's him. Don't be too anxious to look for monk fist boxing down there. Uh, of course, the new monk fist boxing all over the place, right? But I did some interesting research into trying to figure that out. Why wasn't there back in the 70s and 80s when I was trying to get hold of this? Why couldn't I find any monk fist boxing? But here it is clearly described in the Bubishi. Apparently, one of the guys who came down from the Shaolin Temple to Fuchen back in the, you know, back in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, during this, you know, political upheaval and the fall of the Manchu uh, government and all this type of stuff, was uh, a merchant. He was not publicly advertised to be teaching monk fist boxing. He was taken in by a guy who was like a tea merchant, and he opened his school in Fuzhou in a in a in a in a shop. What was the shop? Oh, you know, they sold tea and opium and uh, incense and stuff like that. So, but the guy who ran the shop was became very well known for his martial arts. He was known as the incense shop owner. And what kind of kung fu did he do? Incense shop kung fu. I can't believe my ears. Wasn't that the style I saw on my first day in Fujian? This is just insane. I mean, it does look a little like karate, but I didn't see it because I was so focused on White Crane. Heck, I even had tea with the master who demonstrated incense shop boxing. Has the answer really been under my nose this whole time? What I missed was I kept looking for monk fist boxing and I kept seeing the modern monk fist boxing, which is your classic Chan Chuan, but it's southern monk fist that you want that, that became popularized under the name 
incense shop boxing. I don't know what to believe, but I do know that I have to check it out, and I don't have a lot of time left. It's time to head back to the beginning of my journey. It's time to rediscover the lost roots of karate. Continuously hit you. She's going for pressure points now. This is Master Lin. He's a chiropractor. And this is his bone setting clinic. But Master Lin does more than just fix your bones. He can also break them. Because he's the last living master of Southern Shaolin Kung Fu. Also known as incense shop boxing. This is the original style that influenced the roots of karate before White Crane. Master Lin is well known in the local martial arts community because his style is so rare. In fact, it took him 18 tries before his own teacher accepted him as a student. Incense shop only has four kata in their system. These are the same forms described in the Bubishi, the Bible of Karate and its famous self-defense drawings are actually applications of these four kata. I can't believe my luck. With only one day left here in China, I finally find the holy grail of karate. I am so excited to learn more. And Master Lin is equally excited to teach me. Apparently, He's never had a Western student before. And most Chinese people don't want to learn the old styles anymore. That's why he's not actively teaching. Luckily, I am not most people. Hmm. Ah, sorry, I don't speak Chinese. Nice. Great card. That's a rare one. Oh. Incense shop requires a specific posture. Your back needs to be round, and your hips need to be open. Hmm. Together with a sideways body alignment, this allows you to fight at a long range with big motions and dynamic footwork. Wow. <laughs> No, just here. Like uh, this. Uh, more expansion. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So they're moving a lot. With uh, it. Mm. So saying crane is like a small frame. Mm. But there's this big. There's step, oh, there's yeah. 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 Mm. The most unique aspect of instant shot boxing is its power generation method. Unlike white crane, it's not about using your body like a whip. Instead, your body should be like a lever. This is what the first kata actually teaches you. If I'm lucky, I might be able to learn it. Grab his hand. If you fight an opponent at close range, never rely on your eyes. Instead, listen with your body. 
Your kinesthetic awareness will always be faster than your visual sense. Try and move him. He can go under as well. Go high. Continuously hit you. So he's going for pressure points now. Ribs, sweep. Oh, he wants to go have tea now. Thank you very much. Over a cup of tea, Master Lin explains that the style was founded by Shaolin monks who escaped when their temple was burnt down during political upheaval. A lot of the Shaolin monks, they went underground, yeah. right? they went into hiding. Yeah. So um, because this incense shop, they made the incense mm. for the temple. To stay under the radar, they called their style incense shop boxing instead of monk fist boxing. Mm. Mm. They just named the style they practiced after their shop yeah. in order to sort of conceal their connection to... Yeah. to so more finish. for political reasons than anything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suddenly, Master Lin walks over to the corner of the room. Apparently, my visit has inspired him to make me a calligraphy. Master Lin is not only a kung fu legend and bone setter, he's also a calligraphy master. I'm speechless. All I can do is watch as the master carefully brushes two characters that literally mean stop, violence. Together, they become one big character that represents martial arts. In Chinese, it's pronounced Wu. In Japanese, we say Bu. Wow. Okay, okay. Okay. They're going to hang it up to dry somewhere. As the ink dries, we head over for lunch. To be honest, I've never been a fan of the Chinese food we get in the West. But this is super delicious, just like the first day I arrived. Believe it or not, there's a special way to make a toast if you're a Kung Fu teacher. It looks like this. In the old days, a master would determine your skill level by sensing your pressure as the glasses touch. A couple of toasts later, we're back at the clinic and I'm finally presented with my gift. What an amazing honor. I couldn't have wished for a more awesome way to end this trip. But it's not over. Turns out, Master Lin wants to give me one more thing before I fly home. In just a few moments, I'm learning the first kata of incense shop boxing. Master Lin has never taught this to a foreigner before. To my big surprise, I actually recognize the form. It's the only kata that exists in every major karate style. Which makes complete sense, since the Okinawans learned it before styles even existed. In karate, we call it Seisan or Hangetsu. But of course, this is ten times more complex. 
啊。他是用的时候啊，这个水就要要有你要翘手碰，这样才能过。你不能这样过不开呀，翘碰啊，才能过了他一拍，砰，他就下去了啊。屁股来一个，屁股来。And use your ass as well. My ass. 他在这这里，我说又回到这里吗？啊，屁股来，哎，对对对,对，这个手是阴阳的，这是阳性的，啊，这里要给他，这里要给他这个平衡。啊，这个要转吧，转正。嗯嗯，转过来一下，抛，呀，抛，啊，啊，转换来一下，抛。哎，对了，手都是这样的。那我们是翘手术，哇，你这个弯弯就在。After learning the whole kata, plus a couple of interesting applications and partner exercises, it's finally time to say goodbye. My time in China has come to an end. To be honest, this trip went way above my expectations. From arriving in Fuzhou and learning the essence of whooping crane kung fu, to visiting the birthplace of White Crane in Yongchun village, to experiencing dog boxing on my way to the mythological southern Shaolin temple, and then discovering karate's weapons in Quanzhou, to finally coming full circle back to where it all began. It's now clear that karate came from two main styles of kung fu. The first was Southern Shaolin, today known as incense shop boxing. The second was white crane kung fu, and whooping crane in particular. Together with the weapons of five ancestors, this vast body of knowledge provided the historical framework through which karate initially unfolded and ultimately transcended. From ancient China to modern Olympics. There's a famous saying that, at the end of our explorations, we shall arrive back where we first started and know it for the very first time. I can safely say that it's true. Hello. <laughs> As I share the discoveries, stories and gifts that I received in China, I realized that my experience will probably take a lifetime to unpack. Luckily, karate is my way of life, and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. To you, this might seem like the end, but to me, it's just the beginning. I can't wait to see what's next. How about you?